Howdy. Somehow, The Simpsons hasn't slowed a day in production, with season 32 being completely made and released during a certain eventful time in 2020. So to celebrate, or just marvel at the series' astonishing continued momentum, let's check out the top 5 worst and best modern Simpsons episodes. But you know, this list wouldn't be complete without my favourite Simpsons reviewer, The Real Jims. Hey there, Strider. Sure, I'd be happy to help out reviewing these episodes. Hey, Real Jims. Welcome back, man. Good to see ya. Quick question before we start. Originally, I discussed seasons 15 or later. Can we really call the year 2001 modern? Yeah, well, maybe it's a stretch, but I just really wanted to talk about the notorious Simpson Safari episode from season 12. Oh? Well, I'm always down for that. I'm ready when you are. Alright, great. On to the countdown. So, surprising no one, starting with the fifth worst, Simpson Safari. <sighs> when you hear the title Simpson Safari, you might picture a grand scope, fascinating Simpsons adventure through the ruthless African rainforest. Yeah, no. Instead, we get monkey jokes, bag boy jokes, more monkey jokes, and that stupid Magungo joke. What shall we do, Nagungo? You are Nagungo now! Simpson Safari is in that stupid and boring category of Simpsons episodes. It's littered with mind-numbingly awful jokes. Like this one, which is among the worst, most obvious jokes in series history. Bart is playing Safari Bingo and crosses out Warthog. He says, All right, I got another one. Lisa says, You didn't see a Warthog. Bart says, I'm looking at one right now. So Lisa says, Marge, Bart implied I'm a Warthog. And Marge says, no one's a warthog. And Bart says, what about him? The joke is, there was actually a warthog in the car the entire time. The entire time. The warthog was in the car the entire time. Wait a minute, this sounds familiar. Strider, did you just copy my 2016 reaction word for word? <laughs> Sorry. It's just your reaction to that joke makes me laugh every time I hear it. No worries. At the very least, someone got a laugh out of that warthog joke. Did you have any jokes in Simpsons Safari that you actually liked? Well, honestly, I looked really carefully for a single joke that made me even slightly smirk. But from the eye-rolling jokes of Springfield abusing the bag boys to these groaner animal jokes, Oh, now come on. To that stupid McGungo joke. You are McGungo! Don't worry, I won't subject you to that awful joke twice. I just couldn't find a single memorable joke. Sometimes it feels like the jokes were written by an algorithm. In this case, the computer spit out a joke combining suitcases and giant spiders. The reason this one's first on the list, though, is most of the jokes don't upset me. I can hear them and just roll my eyes at how corny and stupid they are. And, well, for an episode featuring monkeys working in diamond mines, the story is relatively coherent, at least compared to the other examples on this list. We've only reached the tip of the iceberg when it comes to weird Simpsons plots. You are Nagungo now! And for the fifth best... Brick Like Me. Maybe I'm biased, but I really think Modern Simpsons outdoes itself in different styled episodes like this. There's just never a boring moment in this episode. They're constantly switching styles between Brickimation and Simpsons animation, sometimes even melding the two together. <coughs> oh, brick me! While at the same time they're unraveling a mystery that leads to a surprisingly action-packed conclusion. And you know the other part I like? To quote you, Jims, this certainly isn't jerk-ass Homer we're getting here. This is a Homer with integrity that shows he can be a kind dad and still be very funny. I assume Lisa told you about the pretend tiny town she's building with her overweight father. Oh yeah, it's gonna be mucho fresh. In fact, I'd call this Homer at his most charming and enjoyable. Yeah, jerkass Homer is nowhere to be seen in this one. There's definitely a good ratio of jokes that land here. I found that from the seven minute mark onward, almost every joke was worthy of at least a smirk. Many of these jokes are done through the clever use of animation. Did you guys see that? Oh, it's getting worse! I personally really enjoyed as well that the story was based around Homer and Lisa. Homer and Lisa are probably my favorite team-up combo in The Simpsons. I swear I could have watched a whole episode of them just playing truth or dare at Homer's work in their sleepover. I'm going after him! <laughs> <laughs> so I always like seeing an episode based around them bonding. There's a memorable message too about letting yourself and your loved ones grow up and move on in their life. Not getting stuck in a time from our past. 
I feel like Brick Like Me gives us a good combination of the best qualities of modern Simpsons. It retains intelligence and writing, is true to the characters, and is still genuinely touching and beautiful at moments, just like in very early Simpsons seasons. Also, a much bigger budget lets modern Simpsons get much more creative with its art style, as we can see here. Personally, I call Brick Like Me one of the best modern Simpsons episodes we've gotten in years. And for the fourth worst, the greatest story ever doed. By the end of this episode, Homer will think he's the Messiah. Yes, I am dead serious. Messiah away! I should point out, obviously, my dislike of this episode has absolutely nothing to do with Israel itself. While I don't know much about the country, it looks like a place rich in history and stories. And certainly not worthy of such a horrendously written travel episode. Why drag Israel into this mess? Some people like the concept of this one, but personally, I felt this was dead on arrival. You see, Flanders believes in an afterlife and wants to get Homer into it. So he decides to take the Simpsons to Israel for some reason. Is anyone else kind of confused on how this holy place is meant to get Homer into the Christian afterlife? I mean, I know it's a holy place, but how's that meant to help? Regardless of what viewers think of the story, there just aren't many jokes here that didn't leave me groaning. Yeah, some of these jokes get really cringy. This episode gives birth to one of the most annoying, ear-grating voices in the entire history of The Simpsons. And he has a shocking amount of long-winded speeches with no interruption to break the irritation. Go on, shut your face, let's go! But it says here in the brochure... Brochure? 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 Who wrote your brochure? I'm sorry to draw so much attention to this one guy, but his only shtick seems to be being rude to tourists. The disappointing thing about it is that they could have done something legitimately interesting with this backdrop. These places do have a rich history. Even Homer's Messiah complex is based on a real thing. If you enjoy learning a bit about the history of Israel, do you really want to hear it from a character this annoying? I have nothing against his voice acting. I love me some Sasha Baron Cohen. I just think this is a very poorly written character. He didn't really have much to work with here. And apart from that, the only other real joke here that seems to be happening is Homer showing off how uh, sinful and beyond redemption he is. Homer, please, please, please. Bleh. Homer is actually pretty tame overall. He mostly just cares about eating at the buffet and spending time with his kids. Then he does looking at the history tour. He's not really being selfish or cruel. He just knows his personal priorities. Even Simpsons movie Homer was more jerk-ass than this. You come all the way to Jerusalem, the happiest place on earth, and all the photos in your camera are of funny soda pops? Ned, who cares? At least Homer and his family are having some fun. Ned finally decides that Homer is not worth saving and storms off. Thinking Ned stormed off into the desert, Homer ventures out on a camel to try to rescue him. They're really not doing a bang-up job of making Homer seem sinful here. He's now risked his life without hesitation to save his neighbor. Yeah, he's mostly a well-meaning guy in this one. Anyway, Homer gets lost in the desert. While it turns out, Ned was just watching a movie. Then Homer decides he's the Messiah because he had a dream with Veggie Tales in it. Stupidity ensues, and an ending certainly not worthy of the highly intelligent and talented writing team behind this show even today. To me, the greatest story ever doed just felt unstructured, silly, and annoying. And I think the fourth best modern Simpsons episode is... Eternal Moonshine of the Simpsons Mind. There's an unshakable feeling of surrealism to this episode. The flashbacks slowly reveal hints of what happened with Homer and Marge, leaving the viewer's imagination to consider or worry about just what happened that night. The endless fluttering moths are a nice bizarre touch to the flashbacks too. It really puts the viewer in Homer's shoes, because he's just as confused as we are, and we share in that feeling of unease with him, as his mind ticks over on what could have happened. What gets me the most here is that sense of mystery and intrigue. The question of why Homer's family has disappeared becomes more and more concerning as we go. I can't think of a time since Who Shot Mr. Burns that they've set up such an intriguing mystery. Why would I want to wipe out my memory? What horrible thing did I do? When I saw Marge with that black eye the first time, I gasped. The second time I saw it, I gasped again. But it's done tastefully, as Homer is just as disturbed as the viewer at the idea that he might have done that to Marge. I would never hurt Marge! I'm a good man! We get a good taste of the rest of Springfield's residents here too. From Chief Wiggum, to Grandpa, to Krusty, to Professor Frank. 
So many Springfield residents get a turn at the spotlight. And a whole lot of the jokes left me with a smirk. Grandpa's lines particularly. You come to me for help remembering? That's like asking your heart to do your taxes, which I did back in 1998. Do you have a particular favorite joke in this one, Strider? Well, I'd say the joke that made me laugh the most was probably at the beginning, when Mo is trying to pause his face on a video shot that doesn't make him look hideous. This is so dang relatable to me. Whoa! What about you, Jims? Did you have any favorite parts to this episode? I really like how they play with the visuals and the sense of continuity they bring to the whole thing. Lots of references to old episodes and history and stuff. Bringing Bart and Lisa into the story as we explore Homer's memory added that extra wrinkle to those scenes. That cell phone joke was pretty funny too. It lasted just long enough to give that crazy weird dreamlike feeling. Hello, I'd like to order a pizza. 35 minutes. The characters really feel on point here too. All of Springfield feels mostly in character here. But seeing Patty and Selma try to kill Homer was about the only part that was a little too cold-blooded even for them. But apart from that, I found myself enjoying the entire Springfield cast here. Overall, Eternal Moonshine of the Simpson Mine is definitely a mystery worth unfolding at least once. And for the third worst, what to expect when Bart's expecting. First off, I gotta say, hats off to the couch gag here inside Homer, where we get a deep, intricate look at the inside of Homer's body from a Polish animator's perspective. Michael Socha. In recent years, these couch gags have really become works of art that stand on their own. Sadly, the couch gag was probably my favorite part of the episode by far. Interestingly, this episode received the second lowest ratings ever in the series history. It was marked by reporters as a ratings crisis at the time. Huh, maybe just no one felt like watching The Simpsons that night. Or maybe when they saw on the TV guide, Bart magically impregnates a horse, they just thought, screw it, let's all take a walk outside. Anyway, I'm not going to say all the jokes in this episode are appalling. I mean, this joke made me smirk a little. Oh, I just came in to take out the trash. And you shall leave immortal. But so many jokes really made me groan. Oh, just you wait till you hear the plot of this episode. You see, Bart is enraged with his art teacher because she encouraged him. No, it's not. Because I hate art. Oh, then it's protest art. Stop encouraging me. Oh, come on. I know, I know, Strider. It's not exactly a shining Bart moment. Anyway, because of this, Bart decides to put a voodoo curse on his art teacher. But instead, the art teacher gets pregnant. Unfortunately, this doesn't exactly result in high caliber jokes. Bart Simpson got a teacher pregnant! You're happy with your two-timing boyfriend now? So let's get the obvious out of the way. This premise is completely insane. Like, straight up cuckoo bananas territory. Just how many laughs can we actually get from Bart magically impregnating people? So Bart becomes the womb wizard, and Fat Tony wants this womb wizard to magically impregnate a horse. Even putting the stupid premise aside, a lot of the jokes are like beating a dead horse. Ha <laughs> ha! Ah, apart from seeing naked groundskeeper Willie and a horse dancing to its reigning men, I didn't chuckle at a single thing. And you know, even those are pretty cheap lowbrow jokes. I mean, they're like a comedian dropping their pants on stage. They may get a quick laugh, but they're also going to lose all credibility in the process. Probably the part that had me cringing the most was Bart and Homer randomly breaking out into song. Oh yeah, the song about horses making love? That was really, really stupid. Let them play, we won't look, we'll turn away. And it's not like it's a short momentary ditty either. This song goes for a solid two minutes. Even if the monorail song hadn't been brilliant, at least it only went for about 20 seconds. If I wanted a bad homage to Les Mis, I'd go listen to those Russell Crowe versions. Anyway, they fill out the rest of the episode with more humorless jokes, mostly about horse pregnancies. One of the writers just seemed to find horse pregnancies really funny. And for goodness sakes, at the end, a year passes and all the kids look exactly the same age. How hard would it actually have been to just make the kids grow up a tiny little bit? Well, I suppose that mystery is reserved for Simpsons future episodes. And speaking of awkward segues to the Simpsons future, let's check out the next best episode. And for the third best... Barthood. Oh, I see what you did there, Jims. <laughs> Clever. Uh, Thanks, Strider. Anyway, Barthood does a good five or six seasons worth of character development for Bart all in one episode. Much like season one's Moaning Lisa, it uncovers so many insights about the character. We get further insight into so many characters here. 
including Lisa and even Grandpa, one of my favorite characters. We start from Bart's young years, proceed through his teenhood, and even into his adult years. It's not just a sob story for Bart either. The characters feel surprisingly realistic and raw. We can at least partially see why Homer would struggle to inspire Bart with positive reinforcement, when he causes so much chaos. It's easy to see why Lisa's talent might get her a lot of the praise and attention growing up. Very nice painting, Lisa. We're putting it right over the couch. There were a few moments that really stuck with me in this episode. One of which was seeing Bart's sticker he made get accidentally thrown out of the car and into a dirty puddle. <laughs> the other was Lisa's outburst at Bart when he blames her for being second best. I'm sick and tired of you blaming me for every setback you have ever had. I almost feel like this is speaking for the younger sibling in a family, who's often being told they're being treated better than the older sibling. I often think of that moment where Homer's trying to reach out to his son, but Bart just won't take his eyes off his phone. There's something very real about this moment, or Bart walking in on Homer smoking weed. <laughs> Are you crazy? What if the cops come? The episode's full of memorable moments. If I were to nitpick though, I would say I could probably use more laughs in this episode. It's a treat to get these more serious, character-focused stories, but just a few extra laughs would help keep it in the Simpsons spirit. Bart Hood feels epic, but compact at the same time. It's easily one of the most polished, well-written modern Simpsons episodes I've ever seen. And the second worst modern Simpsons episode is... Clown in the Dumps. This is a strange episode. It's strange? Why is that? Because they mix together the most boring Simpsons episode of all time with the most bizarre couch gag of all time. This is seriously the weirdest couch gag we've ever gotten in the entire series. And that's against some really, really stiff competition. I know, right? I feel like an entire analysis of this couch gag could be done. Which honestly, would be way more interesting than anything I have to say about Clown in the Dumps. Shall we do a 60 second review of Clown in the Dumps? Yeah, that's a great idea. So did you hear they're going to kill off a major character in the season premiere? I can't wait to find out who. Oh, never mind, it's just Krusty's dad. And they're changing the relationship to Krusty getting upset that his dad didn't think he was funny. Fascinating. Unfunny jokes are abound, such as Chief Wiggum showing grisly death evidence shots to the kids at sleepovers, or a bunch of sad funeral jokes, or Marge blowing a raspberry. Truly fascinating. The Sideshow Bob cameo is probably the only highlight, otherwise it's not exactly breaking new ground in terms of comedy. I'm a sad, tragic clown. I'm really tired of this boring premise in cartoons. At this point, a happy clown would actually be a real shock to me. Krusty retires, gets bored, gets drunk, hallucinates that he goes to Jewish heaven, and decides he's going to do something good for society. There's also a side plot about Lisa getting anxiety about her dad's death and obsessively trying to keep him safe. When she saves him from getting hit by a bus, this makes her feel a moment of control, which is apparently enough for her. There's a filler song about Jewish heaven to clean up the additional minutes, and thankfully the episode's over. It's a stupid episode. Lisa playing the harp in the intro was my favorite part. Alright, done. Even if the actual episode is really boring overall, just look at everything going on in this couch gag. In a brief moment, we transition from 2014 to 1987, then thousands of years into the future. Did you notice when he's still in the first hundred or so years, we can still see the 40-year-old Bart and his two sons on the picture on the wall? If we slow it down as time transitions, we can see the couch rapidly waste away too. The couch room even briefly transforms into what looks like a Minecraft version. The room goes through so many changes, from being a weird mosaic, even a candy land at one point. I like the extra detail of the change in language in the future too. Instead of dates, we get these sun dates in 10,535. Then we get to a somehow even weirder part in the Simpsons episode 164,775. Homer has become what looks to be some sort of simplified digital organism in a world where whatever is still alive to some degree worships the moon god. So the episode instructs viewers to beam episode now into exoskulls and vigorously touch flippers. Weird. They also seem to be asking viewers to buy Simpsons branded merchandise, such as a laser hat, moon vest, ape spray, and uh, mating gel. 
Viewers apparently are meant to rub it on their flippers. What, like dolphin flippers? I don't know. Maybe dolphins took over the Earth? I remember the Trials of Horror episode about that. Jumping somehow even further in time to the year 20,254, the family have become even more simplified, multi-celled organisms that seem to claim they are a happy family. Am I the only one getting a little freaked out by this? No, this is legitimately freaky. And we finish on Homer saying, Damn. Make what you want of this weird thing. It was apparently created by Don Hertzfeld, a very talented independent filmmaker. And I think the second best modern Simpsons episode is... Simpsorama. Take notes, family guy. This is how you do a Simpsons crossover episode. In fact, I'd probably call this my absolute favorite cartoon crossover episode. Everyone feels true to their character here, and they react exactly how you'd expect them to react to meeting one another. Oh, don't mention her eye. Don't mention her eye. Don't mention her hair. Don't mention her hair. I am so pleased to meet you. Nice to be here. We also get a good balanced taste here of both the Simpsons world and the Futurama world. <laughs> Why are you little? Why are you little? You know, it's amazing. With a 14 times smaller budget, Simpsorama managed to entertain me far more than the Simpsons movie ever did. What's the robot version of bromance? Romance! You future guys have a word for everything, pal. This is a case where I probably still would have enjoyed the episode, even if the jokes didn't work. Because seeing both the Simpsons and Futurama cast interacting for the first time is such a novelty. How cool is it seeing Bender drinking with Homer at Moe's Tavern? For all you know. For all we know. It's also got that warm modern Simpsons sweetness in spades, which here I think is just the right approach. It's just those small extra details I appreciate, like seeing Homer ask to be Bender's friend, or the way both sides quickly come together to save the future from Bart. These jokes won't necessarily have you laughing out loud, but they'll probably leave you with a smile. Like Bart and Lisa noticing how similarly drawn Homer and Bender are, or when Bender just sticks out his tongue to the screen for six seconds straight. I'm certainly not bursting at my sides, but these jokes are just brimming with charm and character. Yeah, the episode really holds a lampshade to the similar character designs between Simpsons and Futurama. I've heard some viewers complain that the episode was too rushed, but I felt they actually kept a pretty steady pace here. We get plenty of time for the delivery crew to meet the Simpsons, and even a little time for Bender to take Maggie to the horse track. It's a combination of two characters I never expected to see, but certainly enjoyed. Simpsorama gave me everything I could hope for in this crossover. Future jokes, Springfield jokes, topical jokes, yet it's never too on the nose at the same time. It retains that modern day Simpsons charm. Thanks, pal. And before we get to the number ones, let's go through our quick honorable mentions. Trilogy of Error. I love what a strong sense of urgency and momentum the story has. My only real complaint with this episode is it didn't leave me laughing much. I felt it could have used a few extra laughs just to lighten the extreme urgency of Homer's dire situation of losing his finger. Trilogy of Error could be called Three Shallow Stories Told in the Most Interesting Way Possible, and it probably is. The narrative is the magic that holds this Simpson sandwich together, with no greasy mayo in between slowing it down. Yeah, I'm not much of a mayo fan either greasy, tasteless junk getting in the way of a good sandwich. Well, mayo slander aside, I consider Trilogy of Error easily one of the best Simpsons episodes of the 2000s. Simple Simpson. This one's a personal favorite of mine, but I just can't fully justify it as one of the best modern episodes. I actually put this one on my best Simpsons list about five years ago, but frankly, I am still kicking myself for the amount of fantastic episodes I missed on that list. Ah, oh, man, what was I thinking? So let's just call this an honorable mention. And for the dishonorable mentions, Boy is a Bummer. This one is infamous for how the whole town bullies Bart into going crazy and attempting suicide. And if I hadn't already talked about it four years ago on my worst Simpsons vid, I'd certainly consider adding it here. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Guest Star. This wasn't recommended that often, but I personally just consider it a really dumb episode. Every time I've seen it, I felt bored by the overdone concept and completely unchallenged. The Musk who fell to Earth and Lisa goes gaga. Hey Jims, I remember you mentioning Musk who fell to Earth as one of your absolute least favorites. Yep, when people criticize the Lady Gaga episode for fawning all over her, I feel like this is somehow even worse. 
Plus, Elon Musk has absolutely zero charisma or acting skills. And believe me, I'm the expert on zero charisma and acting skills. This is definitely among my least favorite on this list. What I really didn't get was Lisa, of all people, being won over in the end. Yeah, exactly. It was a complete 180 for Lisa, who just blasted her like a minute ago. Anyway, I think we can both agree Lisa Goes Gaga is a stupid episode, though I was much more insulted and you just felt bored by it. Yep, exactly. So what's next? Every man's dream. More like every Simpsons fan's nightmare. Once again, I talked about this lousy episode before in worst adult cartoon episodes, so I gave it a skip. In my opinion, it's uneventful, silly, boring, and has way too much jerk-ass Homer. That 90s show. I know, there's a lot of these, but you know, it's The Simpsons. They've been going on for over 600 episodes now. I don't really hate the execution of this story. There's some decent jokes here and there, but the concept is infamous, to say the least. As far as I could tell, I think the main concept that bothers everyone here is the fact that the Simpsons writers are retconning the entire Simpsons history. That suddenly, Bart wasn't born in the 80s, but the 90s. And apparently Homer and Marge were married in the 90s too? It's like drawing a big neon sign over the series that says, Our characters have no set history and their timelines are continually going to change with the times. Viewers didn't take it very well. Anyway, with those said, on to the number ones. And I think the number one worst modern Simpsons episode is... Codependence Day. What makes this episode such a compelling candidate for the number one worst? Because it's awful and I hate it. It stinks, it stinks, it stinks. Yes, Mr. Sherman, everything stinks. Alcoholism is a subject that can be tackled if treated with respect and care. But Codependence Day completely fumbles that subject. The writing is some of the clumsiest I've ever seen in the show. It basically just draws a stage light onto the darkest aspect of Homer and Marge's relationship. The fact that Homer will never change and Marge will always forgive him anyway. Yeah, this is definitely among the worst cases of jerk-ass Homer I've ever seen. Basically, the story is that Homer and Marge start drinking together. The first act is fine enough. It's nice seeing them enjoy an activity together. Eventually, this leads to Marge drinking too much, and she has to curb her habits. But during this, Homer does perhaps the worst thing he's ever done to Marge. Frame her for a DUI. Oh, this is a new low for me. <laughs> Which unfortunately makes the rest of the plot DOA. Huh? Dead on arrival. Oh, right, right, sorry. No worries, Chief Wiggum runs into this issue too. Oh my god, he's dead? Oh wait, I mean DWI. <laughs> anyway, despite all that, we're still somehow in the second of three acts. Homer has just proved himself to be complete garbage to his wife. So how can the story possibly explain this situation away? After what Homer just did, I guess there was only three options the writers could go with. Either Marge finally divorces Homer, or Homer stops drinking, or Marge returns to an unhealthy, codependent relationship. Well, because the show has to deal with the status quo, we unfortunately could only do the latter. By Act 3, Marge feels better because she decided in rehab that she likes drinking with Homer. And apparently that means something. Who cares? Homer should be off building the Taj Mahal after what he did to Marge, but apparently it's okay because Homer says he'll give up drinking clear liquids. Well, that's just great. You really mean it? Hey, anything's possible. <sighs> There's something to be said about modern Simpsons having just eye-roller boring jokes. But when a Simpsons episode feels legitimately anger-inducing, that's a special kind of awful. And even mess up a very serious subject. I've often wondered what the team's goal was for the viewers right here. They can't seem to decide on whether this ending is supposed to be really dark, or if some learning and growing has occurred. If they want me to think that Homer and Marge have an unhealthy, codependent relationship they're trapped in, then congratulations. A winner is you, Codependence Day. Was there anything you liked about the episode, Jims? Well, maybe a couple of things. The Star Wars prequel jokes were fine. It's a nice reminder of how people reacted to these movies at the time but they actually portray a lot of viewers' issues with the movies. A couple of the Marge and Homer drinking jokes were cute too. Yeah, that was probably my favorite part. I think my favorite scene was when Homer and Marge go into Moe's Tavern to go drinking together. Even now, this entire scene still feels surreal to me, yet kind of nice at the same time. <coughs> That'll be four bucks. And that's about it, I think. The first act does do a lot better than the last two because of these decent jokes. Unfortunately, this also makes the episode slide really downhill when we reach the second act. 
From there, it's pretty much an out of control careening cargo train with a brakes cut, unable to stop itself from crashing disastrously. Codependence Day is just a disjointed, annoying, ugly episode that makes Marge and Homer's relationship look very unhealthy. And for the number one best modern Simpsons episode, Holidays of Future Past. Hey, did anyone else rewind this holiday photo sequence a couple of times when they first saw it? It's just really fascinating to me to see how much life and history is packed into this 40 seconds. Fun little details, like it turning out Lisa was bisexual in her college years. Or you can see the couch getting slowly more ragged and tattered as the years pass. They really do use up that couch's lifetime warranty, huh? I counted, and they held onto it for an additional 15 years before finally getting a new one. I suspect that the new couch is some sort of future technology couch, as it doesn't seem they'll get worn like the old one did. Oh uh, yeah, that's... hang on, why are we specifically discussing the Simpsons' future couch? I don't know. I guess it's just easy to get caught up in the tiny details of this episode. The story is set 30 years into the future, and we mainly focus on Bart, Lisa, and Maggie's futures. Though we do get a small glimpse of many other Springfield residents. Help me, my children! <laughs> What a cashless society! The team really outdid themselves in writing here, giving that perfect balance of good jokes but with an emotionally gripping story at the same time. Never feeling too dire or serious, but just enough stakes to keep us interested. And of course, we get my favorite kind of jokes future jokes. Google, even though you've enslaved half the world, you're still a damn fine search engine. How will our craziness of today look from tomorrow's perspective? For those who don't already know the story, it's Christmas, and the Simpsons kids are coming back to Evergreen Terrace with their own kids to see Homer and Marge. I find myself so curious and drawn in to episodes like this or movies like Back to the Future 2, where we see a massive jump in time for characters we know, and suddenly I have a million new questions about these characters. Where do they live? What kind of friends do they keep? Did they have kids? What type of person did they become? I think that's half the fun of these future episodes. How do these characters we know reconnect in a new way? It's giving us a glimpse into a whole new world within The Simpsons. A world that we otherwise never get to see due to that floating timeline. So many questions are answered here in such a short time. It's a shame to see at this point Bart hadn't got himself a job and a nicer home for his kids. But hey, at least we can tell he cares about them. Well, according to the hints we got in other episodes, Bart becomes Chief Justice of the Supreme Court at 50, so I'd like to think that he goes on to study law in a few years' time. We can also see he's wearing the Chief Justice uniform when he's 80 in Flanders' Ladder, so it's nice to know he goes on to get a good job. Every scene has a new callback, a new reference, or some tiny detail to these characters we've known for 30 years. Hey Jims, did you have a particular favorite moment from this episode yourself? I really enjoy this treehouse scene, where Bart and Lisa have gotten a little drunk and discussed their problems with each other. It feels rare to have these two have such an open discussion this raw without it being filled with bickering over something, and it really helps hammer home the emotional core of the story. At least, you're the person I always wanted to be. There's something peaceful and almost timeless about seeing these two reconnect even 30 years later despite so many changes. The Simpsons has always had this underscoring theme about parent-child relationships, so this episode fits perfectly in context with the series as a whole. At the end, Homer can bond with Bart's children and reconnect with his own dad. At the end, Bart and Lisa can share their honest thoughts with each other and earnestly want the other to succeed. I think Holidays of Future Past is a really interesting look into The Simpsons' future, with smart future gags and a solid emotional core. Personally, whatever time of year, it's my favorite modern Simpsons episode to rewatch. You know, I found when making this list, many of the best modern Simpsons moments came along when the show was trying something novel and out of the ordinary. Whether it be changing up the animation, or future episodes, or just solid crossover episodes, I feel modern Simpsons is at its best when it gets daring and thwarts our expectations. As long as the show decides to keep going, I hope we can get a few more episodes like this. And thanks once again for your time, Jims. I'm a big fan of your channel, and it's always a pleasure to have your company on the show. Sure, no problem, Strider. The Simpsons is my channel's bread and butter, so I'm game for a list like this anytime. Smell you later. Catch you later. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Hey Boo, you look different today, but I can't quite put my finger on what's changed. All oh, right, right, new haircut. It looks good on you.